Artificial intelligence has been the field that has uh, struggled to build computational models that can perform feats of intelligence, but it hasn't really been concerned as much with explaining brain or behavioral data. So it's really at the intersection of these fields that I think um, we can make progress. And it's kind of a, um, a long history of trying to meet more and more of these criteria and these previous attempts have not completely succeeded, but I think now is a, a very exciting time to be a, a neuroscientist because uh, we are in a position now to put these uh, pieces of the puzzle together. And there's a, a particular modeling framework, neural networks, that I think will be key to all this. It's a modeling framework that's central um, to this interaction that has a long history in each of these fields. In the 80s, it caused a revolution, a paradigm shift toward uh, ideas of parallel distributed processing and cognitive science. It's got a long history in computational neuroscience at many different levels, some of which we heard about uh, earlier today and in other talks at this conference. So a lot of the work in computational neuroscience is at a very detailed level with spiking models or um, very detailed biologically uh, faithful models. But the kinds of neural networks that I'm going to be talking about are at a very abstract level. You could think of them as modeling uh, the rate coding level. And these networks also have a history in artificial intelligence. And they're currently, as many of you I'm sure have heard, uh, revolutionizing really several domains of artificial intelligence. So they're very exciting from the perspective of what they can do in terms of task performance. So I think this is kind of a perfect storm for the next 20 years or so for us to really engage higher level complex uh, brain processing uh, with explicit models that perform the tasks. So I work in vision. So what does this mean for visual object recognition? Well, in my field, the goal is to build a biologically plausible network model that can recognize novel object images. So it has to be able to perform the task of object recognition. It has to be a computer vision model and predict their neuronal representations and human behavioral responses. So that's uh, sort of the smaller story that I'm going to tell you is about uh, how we got around to beginning to use these models in my lab and to test them with brain and behavioral data. So we present visual object images to our subject. So here's a set of 92 uh, images that are isolated object images from lots of different categories. We present them to our subjects while measuring their brain activity. Subjects can be humans or monkeys that we measure with fMRI or cell recordings. And then we analyze the representations in those brains and the representations in computational models in a single analytical framework that I call representational similarity analysis, or RSA. So here's how this works. We present each image to uh, the brains of our subjects. And in a given region of interest, for each image, we get an activity pattern, which we consider a representation of that particular object. So for another object image, we get another pattern here in the same region of interest. And that's the representation of this object, right? And the difference between these is the representational difference in that brain region. We can play the same game for the models. The models have internal representations as well. So again, for, for each image, we get a unique uh, fingerprint, which is the activity pattern elicited in the internal representation of the model by that image. Now, we want to relate these these representations in order to address the question whether the model is a good model of this particular brain representation. For example, a visual area, say visual area V4. Um, this is difficult at the level of the original responses because we don't know the correspondency between all the units of the model and the measured response channels, for example, the voxels in fMRI or the uh, single cells in neural recordings. So one approach to this is to fit a, a linear forward model to predict each measured response as a linear combination from all of the units of the model. However, as we engage very complex models, they can have hundreds of thousands of units. And then that is fitting a lot of parameters for each of your measurement channels. 
So this is the reason why we take a different approach. We look one level up at the level of the dissimilarities between these activity patterns. We make a matrix indexed vertically and horizontally by the stimuli where for each pair of stimuli we can look up the dissimilarity of these two stimuli in the representation. We call that the representational similarity and this is the representational dissimilarity matrix or RDM. And this is our signature of the representation which tells us what pairs of images are similar in this rep according to this representation and what pairs of Im images are distinct. So what distinctions this representation cares about, if you will. And the this, this signature of the RDM is easy to compare between different representations because it's indexed by the stimuli. So we've abstracted from this confusing multiplicity of uh, single responses and we can very straightforwardly compare different uh, representations now between different brains, between different species, but importantly for today's talk between models and brains. So we have a toolbox on this, the RSA toolbox, which provides methods for statistical inference on brain computational models. So how does this work? Here's a little uh, simulated representational dissimilarity matrix. So here you have all the stimuli, all the other stimuli, and the cold colors here are things that are similar. So you see two clusters here in the simulated example. And then we have a number of model representational dissimilarity matrices. And now it's just about comparing these model representational dissimilarity matrices to the one that we measured in our brain region of interest. So we use a rank correlation to minimize the assumptions made about that relationship in order to assess the fit of each of these models. And then we use a, a permutation and bootstrapping techniques to do inference, frequentist inference on these um, comparisons. So you see that you know, mo most of these, except for um, the last one, are significantly related to uh, the simulated brain representation here. And in addition, we compute a noise ceiling, which tells us, um, given the noise in the data and the intersubject variability, what is the level of performance that we expect for the true model? And this noise ceiling has a, a lower bound and an upper bound, um, and these are lower and upper bound estimates on the performance of the true, true model. And then we do pairwise comparisons, so we, we statistically compare um, each pair of models, usually by bootstrapping the stimulus set. We consider the stimuli uh, a random sample from a population of stimuli, so we can do um, inference comparing these models. And then we draw a horizontal line whenever two models are significantly different. So here these are lots of lines because there are lots of significant comparisons. There are some missing, actually, if you, if you uh, look very carefully. But in general, we have a lot of power there, and we need to um, correct for multiple testing, which here we've done by um, the false discovery rate. So with these tools, we can address whether a model explains significant representational variance, whether it explains significantly more representational variance than another model, whether it explains all the non-noise representational variance. So when it hits the noise ceiling, then uh, it represents uh, the data RDM as well as we would expect for, for the true model given the noise and the intersubject variability in the data. And we use frequentist non-parametric inference controlling for multiple testing and random effects tests uh, across subjects and across stimuli to generalize to the population of subjects because usually we're not interested in our particular group but we want to use our data also to uh, support generalization to the population and also across stimuli because usually we're not particularly interested in the particular set of stimuli um, we've chosen but we're interested in making more general statements about the computational models and we want these computational models to perform for any a random sample of stimuli, and that's really the target of the inference. It also supports searchlight RSA, where we perform these region of interest based analyses all over the brain and do um, inference at the level of these maps, um, again, correcting for the multiple tests across brain locations in that uh, case. 
And we use uh, so a range of distance uh, metrics for measuring representational dissimilarities, including the linear discriminant um, t-value and the cross nobis distance, which bridge the gap between RSA and linear decoding analyses, where you can think of RSA as kind of a generalization of linear decoding, where you do the decoding for all pairs of stimuli, so you get a very um, rich and complete um, characterization of the representational geometry, if you will. So in 2008, we applied this technique to this image set that I showed you in the beginning, and we got these representational dissimilarity matrices for human inferior temporal cortex and monkey inferior temporal cortex, where human IT was measured with fMRI voxels and monkey IT with cell recordings. And you see these clay clusters of animates and inanimates. There's a human face cluster here. There's an animal face cluster here. The animal faces all have different colors and shapes, so this is less of a tight cluster. That might explain the fact that it's not such a tight cluster. And there's also um, very high similarities between patterns elicited uh, uh, when one of the patterns is elicited by a, a human face and the other by an animal face. So the question this posed, so this, was, this categorical structure was strikingly similar between human and monkey, and all, also within these categories, there's a lot of correlation between these two matrices, as we showed in the initial paper. However, the question that this uh, really posed for the purposes of the, the present talk is, can we explain the IT representation with a computational model? Um, enter my graduate student, Sayed Kalik Ratsavi, um, who's uh, here in, in front of his, his new home. He's left the lab and is now a, a postdoc at MIT. So he, his PhD thesis was about comparing the IT representation in human and monkey to many different computational models. So how similar are computer vision representations to IT? That was the first question he asked. So he took lots of models from computer vision, different hand-engineered computer vision features to compare them to IT. So here I'm going to plot for you the accuracy of human IT um, dissimilarity matrix prediction. So as before, that's the RDM correlation between the brain region and each of the models. And let's look at one model. So this, this is the GIST model. This is a particular um, set of computer vision features based on, uh, on summaries of, of Gabor filters. And you see that it performs, uh, it, it explains significant variance in the, the RDM of human IT. It's highly significant. So one could tell a story about this to some extent, right? This clearly shows that there is information about stimuli in this brain region. You could use this information to decode. This is a very um, popular method to decode information in brain regions. And um, there is a particular uh, encoding model here that explains significant variance. However, before we interpret this, we should look at other models. So here's 26 other models, all computer vision features. And we see that they all, almost all of them perform highly significantly. And they explain, some explain a little less variance, other explain a little more variance. But overall, they, they all explain some variance. The important thing to look at is the noise ceiling, which is much higher. So this shows us that there's a lot of variance left unexplained by all of these models. So our conclusion from this exercise was that all these 27 models fail to explain IT. Um, since many of the models explain significant variance, we were interested in testing whether combining the models might help us explain the IT representation. Imagine each of the models has some of the features present in IT, but none of them has all, all of them. So if we combined these features, maybe we could do better. So we remixed and reweighted the representation in order to best explain IT, always cross-validating across images. It's totally uninteresting to us when we overfit to a set of images because this means that the model that we have doesn't really work as a computer vision model. It wouldn't do the task on a new set of images. So we always um, cross-validate. We used a separate image set 
to create these linearly remixed filters where we fitted three support vector machine discriminants to emphasize the major categorical divisions that are known from the literature to be prominent in IT. And then we reweighted the representation using non-negative least squares where we assigned one weight for each of the model uh, layers and one for each of the three SVM discriminants. So that's kind of a low parametric a uh, way of finding the right mix of features to explain the matrix. And again, always cross-validated across the images. So when we did that, this is the matrix that we got. You can see that it gets this tight human face cluster just about right, but it doesn't get any of the other sort of obvious categorical features. Here again, for comparison, the human IT and the monkey IT matrix. So it mi mi misses a lot of these categorical divisions it doesn't get the animal face cluster where the faces are much more visually dissimilar. And also it doesn't place the human and the animal faces in a single cluster together. So this also didn't work, um, suggesting that uh, even with combinations of computer vision features, it's not possible um, to explain IT. So this was around 2012 when something happened in computer vision, namely neural networks overtook computer vision features that are hand engineered at computer vision. So just uh, as a quick reminder, neural networks have a long history, um, started, starting perhaps at least as early as the 1940s with McCulloch and Pitts' binary neurons. Then in the 60s, there was a lot of talk about perceptrons and their abilities and limitations. In the 80s, there was the big uh, parallel distributed processing revolution in cognitive science with Rumelhart and McLelland. But in the 90s, neural networks sort of lost steam. They didn't work as well on real world problems uh, and computer scientists largely lost faith in this modeling strategy. They thought other shallower machine learning techniques such as support vector machines had better mathematical theor theory and also uh, less problems of uh, training time complexity and uh, work better in, in practical applications also. But more recently, there have been breakthroughs with deep learning. In the mid-2000s, Hinton, Benjiu and Lacan, researchers who believed in the uh, usefulness of deep hierarchies and the sort of ultimate superiority of deep hierarchies kept at it and solved the technical problems and it turned out that these uh, limitations that people faced before were not fundamental limitations but there were um, just hurdles to be overcome and they were overcome in this period and in the um, last five to eight years perhaps with growing computing power and large labeled data sets, this has led to major advances in computer vision and also in many other AI applications using both feed forward and recurrent neural nets where increasingly you have these networks and technological applications and they're invading our, our cell phones for, for computer vision and language understanding and even translation and higher semantic tasks. So here we tested a particular kind of deep neural network, a deep convolutional neural net. So how does that work? It has these little filters and they look like the Bohr filters here. So uh, it takes a little local filter um, and then convolves the entire image with that filter producing a spatial map um, where each unit detects a feature of this shape in the image at that location. And then this filtering operation is repeated for different particular filters. So you get these multiple maps of the image that highlight different features. Then a static nonlinearity is applied. Often that's a rectified linear activation function where the output of the filter is set to zero if it's negative and otherwise it's just passed through. And that's often followed by some kind of pooling, either local max or average pooling and local normalization. And these steps together are considered a layer and then there's uh, multiple layers of this type. In the network that I'm gonna show you, there's five convolutional layers and then a couple of fully connected layers following that. But people have since moved on to much deeper networks up to you know, uh, between 100 and 200 layers. 
So here are the results for the deep supervised convolutional network, which was trained by Krzyzewski et al. And this is the network that convinced people in computer vision to uh, switch gears and start using neural nets. And there's been no looking back in, in computer vision since. So when we look at the first layer, it uh, has a very low performance at explaining the IT representational geometry. However, it is significant, but it's far from, from the noise ceiling. So it's clearly not, not a good model for IT. So here, to give you a bit more detail on the noise ceiling, the upper bound of the noise ceiling is the highest accuracy that any model can achieve, given the fact that what I'm plotting here is the mean correlation across subjects, and all the subjects are different. So there is some RDM sort of at the center of the cloud of points that correspond to the single subjects that has the maximum mean correlation. And um, no model, no matter what RDM it predicts, can exceed that, right? So that's a hard upper bound. And then the lower bound is just using the other subjects average as a model. So that's basically saying, let's use uh, uh, all the other subjects data RDMs as our stand-in for the true model. But because, of, because that's a noisy estimate, it slightly underestimates the performance of the true model, so it gives us a lower bound estimate on the performance of the true model. So here for comparison again is the performance range of the computer vision features. So as we go up these layers, we, we get into this range of the computer vision features, and then we get significantly better in the higher layers of the network. But we're still some ways away from the noise ceiling here. So again, we asked, and, and these, these representations are significantly better than the, the early representations. So again, we asked, uh, can we play the same game that we tried for uh, the computer vision features and remix and reweight the features of this very rich representational space in the deep net to better explain the IT representation. So we followed exactly the same process. We trained three SVM discriminants on separate sets of images to emphasize the relevant categorical divisions. And then we used non-negative least squares to train one weight for each layer and one weight for each SVM discriminant. So when we did this for the first time, we got a matrix that looked really qualitatively very much like what we've been looking at for inferior temporal cortex for a long time. Here again, for comparison, the human IT and the monkey IT matrices, you see that the major categorical divisions are now right. The animal phase cluster, the overall phase cluster, the animate inanimate distinction. And also within these categories, there's a lot of correlation between these matrices. So when we look at that model, it still doesn't completely invade the noise ceiling. Here we don't have a lower bound because um, this model is overfitted to our set of subjects, so this lower bound doesn't work for this. Um, but even if it did work, it would be slightly, slightly below, right? So there's still unexplained variance, but this does better than anything we've, we've ever seen, and significantly so. So just as a methodological uh, note here, all of these models explain significant variance, and that's ex uh, essentially asking whether there's mutual information between stimuli and responses. Of course there is, and that's usually what we uh, go for when we use decoding. So from my perspective, decoding is not very useful to learn something about computational mechanism. The important stuff is up here. This is what tells us something about the computational mechanism. It's the comparison of the performances of the different models to the noise ceiling and the comparisons between alternative computational models. So in the last minute, I want to just show you briefly that we can also use these models to predict behavioral responses because ultimately, of course, we want to explain behavior as well. And this is work from postdoc Jan Schare, who's now a lecturer at Birmingham University. So Jan had uh, subjects categorize our image set uh, along several divisions, categorical divisions. I'm only going to show you animate and inanimate. So he gets a, an average reaction time. I'm showing you the subject average here. We're looking at individual subject analyses and average 
analyses, well, for every image, we get a reaction time in this animate, inanimate categorization task. And then our reasoning is that perhaps the way categorization works is by setting up a readout filter for animate, inanimate categorization from the IT representation and then accumulating evidence using that readout filter somewhere in the frontal lobe. So for some images, the evidence uh, on this readout dimension might be strong, leading to fast accumulation of evidence, and for other images it might be weak. So it might take longer for the evidence to accumulate and the reaction to occur. So when we have a representational space here, and this could be a measured representational space from fMRI or cells, or it could be a representational space in a computational model, we can fit this decision boundary, we get a decision value for each of the particular images, and this enables us to plot the decision value against the reaction time, and we expect that when uh, an image is far away from the decision boundary, then the evidence should be accumulating very rapidly and the reaction time should be short. So here I'm showing you this for human IT, measured with fMRI, and we see that there's a, a correlation here. So it's the images, the particular images, that are far from the decision boundary in the human IT representational space um, are the images that subjects can respond more rapidly to. And that's a highly significant correlation. We can play the same game for the deep convolutional network, where we fitted a linear SVM readout for the fin finally uh, the final fully connected layer of the network, and this works even better, um, possibly because the measurements in the deep convolutional network are not noisy measurements, but they're sort of perfect, it's just um, computed from the images, and we can um, predict the reaction times for individual images with even greater accuracy than from their, the subject's IT representation. So just to sum up, there's an emerging literature using deep nets to explain brain computations. It started in 2014 with these three papers. The other two are from Jim DiCarlo's great lab at, at MIT. And last year there was a very good paper from uh, Marcel van Gerven's group. And there's a number of preprints floating around. It's a very fast moving field. And I want to leave you with uh, one central message that I think of as most important from my talk, which is about the novel feature of this literature. I think the novel feature of this literature is that the models perform the tasks, in this case object recognition, under natural conditions, explaining brain activity as well as behavioral responses. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nico, for a very elegant presentation and beautiful slides. Um, uh, questions for Nico? Perhaps I can start off and ask you one question, Nico, about, about the neuroinformatics, neuroinformatics uh, challenges that you've been that are attending these kinds of approaches. How much are you hitting ceilings of, in terms of computational capacity? Um, computational capacity is not our main limitation at the moment. So we bought a number of GPUs and they work very well for us. So one interesting thing to discuss technologically is uh, HPC versus GPU. What is the trade-off there? For us so far, it's looked for, for these applications like GPUs are the way to go for the near future at least. So more generally, um, I think we need to move away from the cottage industry uh, style of doing neuroscience. So in, in my field, uh, we always do essentially the same experiment. We show some visual stimuli and we measure responses and then we analyze them multivariately. And more and more people in my particular field are realizing that this is quite a standard experiment. So it's somewhat st standardizable and making the data shareable. So we're thinking about um, how to move forward with this so that ev every lab doesn't have to necessarily do all of the steps, acquire the data and analyze the data and do the modeling and draw the conclusions, but we can come together as a larger group and pursue this collaboratively. So very nice talk and uh, I want to ask you, um, 
most of the models, the computational models that we use are fit forward, right? Yeah. So um, I mean, we already know that the visual system is full of recurring connections and mm -hmm. operating. So can we really you know, go to the high level of your, the high level message that you that you, you are giving here? Can we really explain something about the brain if we are ignoring all of those reco recurring connections in this model? Yeah. So. The answer to the question as you posed it, can we explain something about the brain, is yes. I think these, these uh, networks capture something about what's going on in the brain, namely the feed-forward sweep. So they go some way toward explaining the feed-forward sweep and behaviorally rapid categorization. However, uh, recurrent processing indeed is our obsession in my lab in particular, and we're, we're training recurrent neural networks, also, this new engineering literature is very much driven by uh, exactly this intuition and uh, has had great successes, for example, in machine translation and in a number of applications with recurrent neural network models. Uh, the earliest successful model was the long short-term memory, but now there's gated recurrent units. There's uh, uh, all kinds of uh, more complex memory mechanisms uh, that are the neural Turing machine that are being explored in the engineering literature. And this is, uh, I think, where the most exciting um, aspect of this whole new literature, I would say. So I, I very much agree with you that we need to incorporate that and that that is, is the, the grand challenge, really. Yeah. Question at the very back. Um, do you think these um, deep network models say anything about uh, learning of object categories in the brain? Yeah, so this is not how we use them because I don't study plasticity, I study perception. So I'm interested in how do these computations work when you see an object, you know, in the first second after uh, the, the object becomes visible to you. That's my object of study. So to me, the way that these models are trained, backpropagation is, might as well be just a hack for setting all these parameters and transferring the rich world knowledge that an intelligent mechanism needs to perform the task into the model, right? However, there's also a very interesting literature on the biological implications of um, different uh, learning rules, including more biologically plausible learning rules such as STDP and Habian learning and you know unsupervised learning techniques, but even backpropagation, right? There, there's so, so this old debate is backpropagation biologically plausible. This, uh, there are arguments on both sides. This is being revisited, and my intuition is that it would be very short-sighted to dismiss it too easily. This is a very complex and interesting. Uh, discussion. There's a, a great review that I would uh, recommend by Marblestone, Wayne and Curding on how the brain might use cost functions and if with using different cost functions in different parts of the brain to train itself uh, in a way that uh, is similar at least functionally to, to backpropagation. And this links this engineering literature to um, the neuroscience literature in a very um, deep way I think. Okay, I think uh, we, we'll call it a stop there. We have more opportunities for questions in the discussion section. Once again, thank you very much. Fascinating.